So today we'll go through this chapter 7. So that's when we deal with the external flow. Right? Flow around stuff. Flow around a cylinder, flow around a sphere, flow around a flat plate. Right? And when I say cylinder, it could also be a bunch of cylinder. And, and you can tell that if the flow is around a bunch of cylinders, it's not simply, let's find out the heat transfer over one cylinder and multiply by 10, for example. Why? Say that again. But even, so Miller is saying it's because the, the flow is disturbed, right? So the flow behind on the next guy is really different, in different direction than the flow on the first guy. Because the second guy is sitting in the wake of the first guy. But also on top of the, of the flow, what else? Beside the velocity that's different, what else is weird? Or will make the second guy not behaving exactly like the first guy from the heat transfer point of view. The velocity is different and huh? it's getting hotter. So if, if we are trying to cool those cylinders with the air, the first layer or the first row was getting very cold air trying to cool them. But now the second layer is being cooled by already warm air. And the fifths and the sixths and the sevenths and the eighths, basically the air is very hot when it goes to them. It's probably not doing anything, right? So there is basically, yes, you can see the economical benefit of let's put all of them together so that we can make uh, this heat exchanger really small, rather than let's make a very long row of all basically facing fresh air. So, but there is a deterioration. We should expect a deterioration in the result as we get more and more rows, right? So we'll see this in the in the formulas, right? So we, again, we said that the external flow here, it's usually the fluid mechanics part is very complex. You have to solve the Navier-Stokes equation to get something like this. What you're looking here is basically flow visualization for the weak behind the cylinder. And it's unsteady, and it has a lot of turbulence into it as well. And that's what makes the solution. Yes, the solution exists, but it's very hard to get analytically. You have to do it using a computer program, computationally basic, just like what you did in your project. Right? So, I guess the first one we are going to deal with is actually flow over a flat plate. Right? And so, in, in all those formulas, we should always expect the Nusselt number where the edge is sitting inside the Nusselt number. The Nusselt number should always be function of, beside x, it should also be function of, it's more than x, it's function of time. No, let's assume steady state, forget about time. The Nusselt number should be function of The heat transfer is really a function of the fluid mechanics part, right? right? It's the fluid mechanics that's continuously changing the flow near the walls that the heat transfer can have good time transferring heat. So the Nusselt number should be function of H. Reynolds number. The Nusselt number should always be function of the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is the fluid mechanics part. The Reynolds number is what make the flow laminar or turbulent, what make the flow move slowly in layer or make the flow moving very rapidly and bounce back and forth, all right? Should, you should always see in the, if you don't see Reynolds number in your formula, something went wrong, all right? So there should always be Reynolds number and that Reynolds number usually should be multiplied by a Prandtl number because that Prandtl number has the ratio between the alpha and the nu. So yes, the flow mechanics is moving the flow and the Reynolds number should be there, but then how does this affect the temperature distribution? How does this affect the heat transfer part, I'm trying to calculate. So that's why you see the parental number, all right? So he's trying to explain here that uh, it's, it's this boundary layer that keep growing, that spread the wall from the free stream. And just like there is a momentum boundary layer, there is a thermal boundary layer. And, and he will explain a little bit about the, the, this boundary layer, right? So we are not going to solve the, the boundary layer equation in this course. But just know that it's why it's there, it's because of the viscosity. 
the viscosity smear the gradient between the u infinity and the wall it make the flow basically doesn't go like zero and then suddenly u infinity no slowly basically it go to u infinity and and that effect get bigger and bigger as we are moving and so as a result because the boundary layer is getting bigger with distance the heat transfer performance the edge will drop with distance so you, when you look at the equation for the edge make sure that basically it's decreasing with x not increasing right the more you go into the plate the worse it gets all right so that's that's an excellent point remind me what's your name again i forgot james, james basically saying this trend will keep going until forever or until this thing just stop being lambda and become turbine because i told you earlier last year last class that after a while this laminar flow will not be able to maintain the status of being laminar he start becoming turbulent right and that that happened by the way at we said on a flat plate this would happen when the x is such that the Reynolds number is 2 to time 10 to power 5 more or less Reynolds x so Reynolds x mean u x over nu so there for any u and any nu for any velocity meter per second and any kinematic viscosity 10 to minus 5 meters square per second there's a certain x where this thing starts becoming turbulent so that layer which was moving like this suddenly become turbulent and you'll have rapid mixing and that rapid mixing is actually pretty good for heat transfer right mm -hmm. so james is saying that when you said that the edge is going to decrease on us as we are moving inside the plate, this is only until it becomes turbulent. Then once it becomes turbulent, we should see the edge improving, right? So that's what we will see. We will see the edge is dropping and then suddenly jumping and you know it becomes turbulent. But then, what happened after this n nice jump in the heat transfer? No, it will not stay. It will start decreasing again. For the same reason, this turbulent boundary layer here, it's also getting bigger and bigger. And yes, it has very good mixing, but still it's a boundary layer. So it starts it start becoming bigger and bigger. So you still separate the very cold T infinity from the very hot T infinity by a bigger boundary layer. Yes, that boundary layer is much more efficient in moving the heat between the two of them. But it's still, it's a bond layer. Ideally, you would like to put the T infinity on the wall. You'll get the best performance ever. Right? Very good. Excellent point, James. All right. And this is uh, a little bit about difference between uh, streamlined body and plough bodies. So, when you see an aeroplane like this or a submarine like this, you know, a very stream, very streamlined body. The, the flow here is basically just shearing the surface. The mechanism for friction is shear stress. The mechanism for pushing on this plate is shear stress. So the, the drag force is mainly because of shear. But when, when you see a body like this, like this plate over here, this guy, so this, why do you think the, if there's any direct force, you know, if you hold this disc in, the, in front of the wind, you'll feel a force on it, right? Where do you think this force is coming from? Right, the low pressure behind it and the high pressure in front of it. So it's the, it's a pressure difference that's really creating this. So those plough body, the direct force on them, is mainly because of the pressure. So we would call it pressure drag. All right? And those will we call them skin friction drag or friction drag or shear drag. So let's call it skin friction drag. Okay? And of course, something like this, you know, like the new Prius, for example, it will probably be... So the, the old Prius was probably just skin friction drag because they tried very hard to make it very streamlined and the people who drove it complained that they cannot see behind them because the way they put the back 
so that they can really make the, the best CD ever. The, the best CD means the CD is really small. They don't want any friction, so that they can hit the 50 mile per gallon and say, wow, we are the only one with 50 mile per gallon. But the, the new one, it's really kind of, they didn't really spend enough time to, to go this way, right? So when it's like this, cannot really tell it's skin friction drag or pressure drag. It's basically a mix between the two of them. And the total force would basically be due the two of them. All right? So we, we talk about this wake region. That's where the flow starts to separate. So when the body is like bluff body like this, the flow have no choice but to separate at the back, right? So when we are looking at the flow around an airfoil, the flow actually can keep going next to the wall forever. But when you actually give me something like this, what, as a fluid, can you imagine what can I do here? I cannot bend immediately at 90 degree and, and go like this. Right? I cannot bend 90 degrees. As a fluid, I have my own inertia. So the point, I come here, I would just have to leave like this. And so what will happen here? It just be a lot of circulation. All right? So that's why any, if you are driving a truck, of course the flow is separated in the, in the bed. Right? So basically the flow here is doing this. Right? So that wake region basically is is what complicate the flow pattern and that's why we rely a lot on experiments. So here is the transition from laminar to turbulent, all right? It take, so you can actually prove this mathematically. You don't have to do experiments to actually figure out the distance where this happened. So you can, you can prove this uh, using stability analysis of all those small disturbance, how long does they take for them to grow? And it turned out it takes this. The critical news number is of order of 10 to power five. So some book will write two, some book will write three. So, so basically I'm saying from 10 to power five to three to power six, that's the transition region. Because it really depends on how turbulent, the, how, how large is the instability, the rough softness of the surface, bunch of reasons. So it's not really just a fixed number. It's a, it's a range. But in our textbook, let's stick with this number. So why do we care that much about that number? Why am I even discussing this with you? That it, the use number need to be this for it to turn into turbulent. Why we care? Right, so we can, we can tell what is the distance at which it will become turbulent? And then in the first part of the plate, we use the laminar formula. And the second part of the plate, we use the turbulent formula. Okay, it's two different mechanisms with two different formula for H. All right? Fortunately for us, there's also one formula that can do the whole thing. Don't worry. No. But from this 5 to 10 to power 5, you can get the news critical or basically the x critical, the distance at which this thing will happen. All right? So they can you can switch to the other formula. And So this thickness, the boundary layer thickness or the boundary layer height, delta, the boundary layer theory that we didn't really go into detail of it, but you, you have the solution for it in chapter six if you're interested, will give you that delta. So that's the height of the boundary layer. It's almost like five, 4.9. So five X over the square root of Reynolds X, All right? And that means that if the fluid is very viscous, the boundary layer would be bigger or smaller? 
if the fluid is really viscous, look at the formula. Delta is 5x over the square root of Reynolds x. That is the square root of Vx over nu. So as nu get bigger, Reynolds number becomes smaller and therefore become bigger, right? So that's uh, that really means that for airplanes and submarines and things are that are flying or swimming at very large Reynolds number, the boundary layer is probably going to be for things that are moving at very large Reynolds number because their velocity is very large. An airplane flying, velocity is very high. The Reynolds number will be very high, and therefore boundary layer thickness is very small. So we are talking about few millimeters, right? And so outside this boundary layer, the flow is actually considered to be as if it doesn't have any viscosity, like uniform flow. Is it, wouldn't it be this nice to solve? Just uniform velocity and just the temperature would be almost like T infinity. And it's only in that small region that's when things drop from U infinity to zero and the drop from T infinity to Ts, okay? So that the guy who actually came up with this was Prantel. He thought that we shouldn't really think about the boundary layer or the viscous flow to be dominating the whole thing. It's only a very small layer, and that layer will get smaller and smaller as the news number get bigger and bigger. Right? And so typical, of course, airplane and typical submarine and typical bus, they have very large news number. You can calculate this because Real is u x over nu and nu air is how much? Ten to minus five meter square and for water it's ten to minus six meter square per second. Actually it, it's very easy to memorize this number because nu is mu over rho and what's rho of water? A thousand and mu of water is Almost 0 0.001, almost. So it's 10 to minus 3 over another 10 to power 3, so that make it 10 to minus 6. So I mean 1,000 and 1 over 1,000, it make it 1 over a million. That's the kind that can have viscosity for the water. And so if the water is 10 to minus 6, immediately then the air is 10 to minus 5. So you can actually memorize both of them. My point is, this viscosity here is already 10 to power 5. If we cancel this, you got ux 10 to power 5. You already have 100,000 just without doing the velocity and the x. So a typical airplane, what's the x we are talking about or a submarine? The x is really big. 10 meter. So you already got 10 multiplied by another 10 to the power 5. That's a million for air. So they're used now, and we didn't even do the velocity yet. This is if it's just like moving at one meter per second. Now let's make it move at 100 meter per second. 300, 200 meter per second, and you can see how the news number will become really, really big. And that makes the boundary layer thickness really small. Right? 5 over, 5x over square root of our news. Right? So, we said that the boundary layer in, in case of lambda and turbulent will be different. The velocity profile, and we spent some time in the last time talking about the, how the velocity profile is different. Huge mixing in the turbulent boundary layer. And that's why the boundary layer was a little bit more full in case of turbulent boundary layer. So it's not a surprise that they have different friction coefficients, right? The turbulent probably will shear stronger or weaker than the laminar. If you have a turbulent boundary layer, will it shear very strongly or it will shear very slowly. Probably very stronger, right? Because the boundary layer is more full. The velocity is very large near the wall. So that, that is the concept why the heat transfer is better for, for turbulent boundary layer also. Because you bring very large temperature next to the wall. So the wall can basically communicate or transfer much quicker. Right? Very good. And, and here he basically explained to us the concept that if, if part of the plate is laminar and the other part is turbulent, and you want to calculate the, the friction on the whole plate, you divide it from 0 to x critical and then from x critical to L. 
and each part has its own CF. So here is the CF for the laminar and here is the CF for the turbulence. Right? Where those formulas came from? So those didn't came from experiment. Those actually came from the theory. There is a theory for that. Right? And also not the same thing for like if you give an H as function of X and you would like to calculate what's the H over the whole plate, you integrate. The same thing for the CF. You also, if you are given local CF, what is the friction at this one point, and you'd like to get the CF over the whole plate, you also integrate from zero to X. That integration is as if you are basically averaging. You'd say, well, how much was it here? How much was it here? And usually the whole thing boils down to just integrating X to power one half or X to power minus one half. So it's not that hard to actually do this integration. All right? So they actually did this formula for a plate which is part, part of it is laminar and then the other part is turbulent. This is laminar and this is turbulent. And they did the integration on those two formulas, okay, that we have here. And so here is the CF over the whole plate. So if you have, if you have a plate that's basically part laminar and part turbulent, you use this. If you have only laminar, you would use the formula for the laminar. So how, how could you tell, let's say, 20 centimeter plate with velocity of oil uh, 10 meter per second, and the viscosity of the oil was given to you, 10 to minus 6, and he asks you to calculate the, the friction coefficient, CF. Should you use the laminar, sorry, the, the laminar formula or the turbulent formula or the mixed formula? How could you tell? You have to calculate the new number at the end of the plate. Excellent. You calculate the new number at the end of the plate, Reynolds L which is u time l over nu, okay? What if this calculation, u l over nu, end up being 10 to the power 5? 1 multiplied by 10 to the power 5. Then? Then use the lambda, because we said that transition happened at 5, 10 to the power 5. So it's all lambda, so I just go basically use the lambda formula. So don't think that that makes this formula will always work. No, it works if you have significant part that is turbulent, right? So what if I calculate that new number at the end of the plate? So the, the flow is going like this. And it turned out to be 10 to power, uh, I don't know, 16? Ten, no, let's make it 10 to power 12. I'm trying to make it really big. 10 to power 12. Then I should use? The Why didn't say the mix it? No, that's not the reason. So Brandon actually is right, but we'll figure out why he's right. What he said, let's go for the turbulent formula, not the mixed formula. And why we shouldn't go for the mixed formula? Excellent. What's your name, Mike? Jacob. Jacob is saying you would use the turbulent formula because the plate would be mostly turbulent. He's saying that the laminar part, of course there, there is a laminar part. The flow, when you first come in, you will have to be laminar. For how much? 10 to the power 5. 5 multiplied by 10 to the power 5. And then from 10 to the power 5 all the way to 10 to the power 12, and that's a lot of distance, the whole thing is turbulent. Right? So, because of this, you basically would say, well, let's actually use the turbulent form. And also, you can see, he, in the laminar, or sorry, in the mixed formula, he told you, you can use this when it's between. 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 7. That's when you would say, you know, it's partly laminar, partly turbulent, let's use a mix. But if it's really big or outside this range, you would go with the turbulent. And that, that is a good point that some, so this one was analytical formula, but some of the formulas that we have are experimental. Meaning they did experiments, they measured the stuff, they best had, came up with the best fit curve, 
And they said, here is the best fit curve. Usually that best fit curve will not work forever. That best fit curve will work in the data range they try to fit. So every formula that you will see will usually have next to it where the use number is between this or that, or the parental number is between this and that. So what if you exceed that range? You have to switch to another formula. And so that's why we have so many in the textbook. Because, well, this one is for low parental number. This one is for large parental number. This one for smooth sphere. This one is for rough sphere. All right? So for example, that CF, for turbulent, that was for a smooth pipe or a smooth plate. And here is another CF for turbulent plate. This formula is even better for rough plate. So if you have a rough plate, you just basically have to use this one. All right? The, the other one would give you more error if you use it. So again, in, in this chapters of convection, we are just picking the right formula. But we just have to listen or read carefully the blue, the the blue uh, line, basically. What is it working? What is it, what is the range that's working for? Okay. And here, what uh, James talked about when he said the edge will I said the edge will keep dropping, right? Because from the start of the plate, from the leading edge, we call this the leading edge, right? The first part or the first point. That's the leading edge over here. And then the flow basically, the boundary layer grow, you make a huge gap between the T infinity and the T S. You're spreading them with a big distance. As a result, H will keep dropping. H and C F because again the fluid mechanics and the heat transfer are really correlated to each other in this problem. It's the fluid that's driving the bound layer and therefore driving the temperature distribution. Okay? So the H is dropping and then I'm saying why here? Well, it's why because you jump to turbulent, right? And once you become turbulent and wow, look at all this mixing. Now we are established turbulent boundary layer. That established turbulent boundary layer will start growing bigger and bigger again, which will drop the H again. All right? But now if, if you are working in a factory or and someone suggests, well, how can we make this flow even uh, more effective in cooling our pipe? You basically tell them, well, let's make it turbulent. All right? So they actually, so how you can make it turbulent? Say the flow it was supposed to go into the pipe and you don't have that much distance. The pipe is not that short and you know, you are in a beer factory or something, and by the time it gets out, it's supposed to be cold. So how can you increase the turbulence level? Right, so maybe you should push the rings number higher and higher. But what if the velocity is basically what the bump can take, and, and we cannot change the velocity, we cannot change the diameter, we cannot change the viscosity. Any other way we can make the turbulence? Right, you are basically saying the same thing, and that is why don't we, because you realize the turbulence is about mixing, why don't we wiggle it ourselves, right? Either by rough wall or... You put an expansion in there to actually cause the engine Excellent. You just invented a technique that people make a lot of money selling. So they actually, they, they put like X's like this. Actually, one of the students that were here in this... Uh, and our campus actually end up working for this company. It's, it's actually a Swiss, Swiss, uh, Swiss company. And they have an office here in Tulsa that they sell those things. And so they, they sell those uh, pipe inserts. So it's really like X's that you mesh them together. And they put them inside. It's, it's really like this. And so as a result, the flow come and basically get hit on the upper wall and then get hit back down on the lower wall. So he, you are basically creating the same chaotic mixing, even was very heavy. If, you are, if this was a catch-up line, you know, something, and the viscosity is really large and we cannot really mix them that well, this will do the trick. Improve the heat transfer and uh, diffusion. All right? So anyway, so turbulence is good for heat transfer and for mixing. 
right? And and that effect, if you cannot, if you don't believe uh, the physics, why it should drop? Just look at the formula for the nozzle number. So h x over k equal to Reynolds x bar 0.5. So So this guy is u x over mu, right? And then you have x over here, so when this x come down there, it would be square root of x at the denominator. So basically, as x get bigger, the h will drop, mathematically, right? And the same thing, but with a different level for the turbulent boundary layer, right? Point is, here is the nozzle number as function of x and the nozzle number as function of x for laminar and turbulent flow, right? And depending on our, uh, whether we are laminar or turbulent, we will use this or to use this one, right? Yes. I don't mean to go off on something else, but um, I'm looking at the laminar formula, we just, we just did. This one, 0.332. Uh, the final number, it says greater than 0.6. Correct. Um, what do we do if it's less than 0.6? That's an excellent question, actually. So, not just the parental number, so any, any experimental data, experimental formula, if when you exceed its limitation or the, the range that the, it's sub recommended for, the, the prediction accuracy of this formula will deteriorate. Will it go immediately to zero? I mean, will it end up going really giving you negative numbers? No. It will just become less and less accurate. Will it drop to 10% accuracy or 50% accuracy? I don't know how really good this formula is unless I, I look at that, the data that they use to correlate this. So in, in, the, in the exam or homework, or actually in, in practice too, you just try to always find the right formula that fit your range. If you can find it, you go for it. If you cannot find it and you are short in time, you just use the closest one, right? So it's always best to make sure that your parental number fit and your range number fit. And if not, if not, then just basically uh, go with the closest one that you can put your hand on, right? So, not this is nozzled X. So that's one mistake that people always use or make. This is only the local H. It's not H on the whole plate. It's not the average H. Again, the H is dropping from us. So to get the average H, we have to integrate. All right? They did. That's for us. And so those are the integrated formulae. Right? So this is nozzled H L over K. Alright? This is for laminar plate and this is for the turbulent plate. And and you give you the range. Right? And in case it's laminar plus turbulent, this would be the, the correlation that he used. And now he tell you basically if well if you have liquid metal and the parental number is is this much, you actually use this formula. So again, if you use the, the formula for the parental number from 0.6 to, to 60, it wouldn't be as accurate as the one that's basically done for that parental number. How much? I don't know until I actually see the, the two correlation and compare the two of them together. And for all liquid, all parental number, well, here is this one that's best for unit time parental greater than 100. And then you get all the other variation on that seam. So it's a flat plate. We didn't go through a cylinder yet. All right? So this is a flat plate with unheated starting lens. So you could argue, well, why they didn't heat the whole thing from the start? Well, maybe the geometry is such that the heater is later on. Maybe they have problem feeding the <coughs> current to the heater at the beginning. But in some application, they have this. So the, as a result, the plate boundary layer, momentum boundary layer, start earlier than the thermal boundary layer. 
right? The temperature profile start changing a little bit later on. So if, so that, how much later? It's this symbol. This symbol is Xi. So you will see the formula and it has Xi over X, all right? So Xi is basically, say, the first 10 centimeter was not heated. And now you would like to find out what is the Reynolds number, sorry, what is the, the Nusselt number at end of the plate, in the middle of the plate. So you will use this formula. So this formula is almost like the previous one, except that it's not just function of x, it's function of xi over x. xi is constant. It's how far is the start of the heating from the leading edge, just like this drawing is suggesting. All right? And again for uh, laminar and for turbulent. And this would be the average over the whole plate. And then another variation on the same problem is those were supposed to be at constant temperature. So you know the TS, you know the surface temperature. The wall is sitting at 100 degrees and you are trying to basically cool it with uh, oil or the water or whatever. Sometimes you actually don't subscribe the temperature. Actually, it's very hard to, to, to specify the temperature. To get the temperature exactly the same that all over the plate, that plate needs to be packed by something that have very large thermal inertia. Something that the oil will not change it. It's like a really big engine and it will always give you all this heat and no matter how quickly the air is moving around it, you will always sit at 100. The, the most actually practical scenario would be you know the Q that leave the wall, but you know you don't know the temperature. And it's actually the purpose of the whole convection thing is we don't want the temperature to get that hot. Just like my iPhone today, I was in the car and uh, the iPhone actually told me there was a, this is the first time it happened. There was a message saying that the iPhone is too hot the temperature is too high to operate. You have to cool it first. Did you guys any get this? So, <laughs> because I left in the car, I went to pick my kids and then came back. So he said, it's too hot, you have to, to cool it first. So, so the, the wall of the iPhone, the temperature is not subscribed. It's the cue that he need to send. So he, oh, he need to, this current going through, that electric resistance going through the, the cycles, the, they generate this many watts, a certain number of watts need to be generated. And so those watts are leaving, if you look here at this drawing, those watts are this per unit area, let's call it Q dot S. So it's watt per meter square to, right? So not only you have to give those five kilowatt or five watt or whatever, but you have a limited surface area that this thing need to send this heat from. So you have the Q S, Q dot S. How much watt per meter square? Now, what is the TS? What control the TS? How can we calculate the TS? Don't look. What, how can I calculate the TS from? Equation, th there is nothing in this three chapter can be solved without that equation. When in doubt, anytime you see any fluid moving, just write this equation and then things will get easier later on. The equation, it's, it's basically Q, capital Q, or if we make it small Q, we'll, we'll cancel the area. So the small Q is H delta T. Very good. All right? So because it was sitting in the car, I guess, the H was like very very small and on top of that the T infinity was very big and the H was really small so the poor thing to get his Q out he need to give this Q out there is no question this Q need to get out right the basically just l running the circuit need to get this Q out so what was the only solution to give this Q this Q is fixed number let's call it 5 with T infinity very hot in the in the in the car, hundred degree, almost. To this afternoon. 
and h is really tiny because the air the air condition is not running and the air is not moving and so what's the only way to get this five ts need to be even bigger and bigger the hotter t infinity get ts need to build on it so that it can still send the five out right so two message basically this is your only way to solve any convection problem it will always go through this equation it just we need another equation to get the edge for us all right and the second is if the q is subscribed you can solve for the ts based on this equation all right and of course if h is function of x this is the same equation right so it's the you're looking at qs is h tx minus t infinity so the only difference here is that it's t of x ts of x because this is h of x the heat transfer coefficient could be different in different places so ts will also be different in different places to maintain the same q okay now the the question is what h should i use should i use laminar boundary layer or turbulent boundary layer neither we use those two formulas so those are for the case for uniform heat flux so notice that the only difference really between those and the previous one are what do you see any difference does anyone remember the previous one make a mental copy of this okay and then let's go to this right the coefficients right so it's the whole chapter will just be some kind of reals multiplied by some kind of Brampton. that's because it's fluid mechanics multiplied by a conversion that Brampton number is conversion between momentum to energy between new and the alpha all right but as, as you can see now we i mean we didn't even go to cylinder yet and we already have eight equations right so far so if if the temperature is not specified but instead q is given those for me are better tools to calculate the h out of them all right again this is nusselt x and from it you will get the t at any x right so let's actually i want to solve a problem on this before we move further do you see how these things will work so So I, I think this was one, uh, it's, it was an exam problem. This is an exam problem. And he said the wind is blowing at 8 meter per second over 5 square, 5 meter square flat roof of a hut. So you have this hut. And that hut is five meters, so five meters square, so five meters along in this direction, five meters normal to it. All right, so the wind blow at eight meters per second over five meters square flat roof of a hut that is part of uh, Antarctic Research Station. So it's very cold, it's actually 250 Kelvin. Okay, so they are freezing there. And the ambient air is approximately 250 Kelvin, and the air properties can be evaluated at 250 since we don't expect a large temperature difference between the roof and the air. So most most external flow from leaves, flow over a flat plate, flow over a cylinder, flow over a sphere. The properties for the rings, remember the rings has viscosity and density and the parental number, the properties are usually at TF, film temperature which is T infinity plus Ts over 2. But in, in this particular problem, he said, just take it at T 
50 infinity because chances are TS is very close to 250. It's not exactly 250, otherwise there is no heat transfer. But he's saying the variation is not that big to affect the properties. So let's just get the property at 250. All right? So given, take properties at 250 Kelvin. All right? Please calculate the average heat transfer coefficient between the air and the roof. So required is H. And he said the average. And he actually put a line under the average to stress that it's the average H, not the local H. Because again, you guys know that there is a boundary layer that will build and the H will be different from the start till the end. So he would like you to get the average. All right. So the, the solution would be How can I get my H? Anyone? I have to get a local H and then integrate it to get the average H. So can anyone help me get a local H? Or a formula for H? Huh? What do you mean? We should calculate the reuse number. That's the first step. For a flow over a flat plate, we should calculate the reuse number because we want to figure out is it laminar or turbulent, right? So that I can put my hand on the right formula. So to calculate the reuse number, Reynolds L, U, L over new, I need the new. So I need, what do I need to calculate the reuse number? I need the new, right? I need to the properties. So actually, before we calculate the reuse number, we should have should have checked the table, right, at 250, and got our properties. So we'll start. We'll say basically table of air at 250 Kelvin, and you will get the K and the parental and the new. So the new is 1.44, 10 to minus 5 meters square per second. So I, I can see why I'm getting the new, because it's in the renewals. Why I'm getting the parental? Because the formula will have to have parental number. So why don't we just get it since we open the table right now? Again, in normal, in other problems, this will not be done at 250 or 1030. This would have been done at... The properties are evaluated at TF, T film, between the plate and the air. Right? Because that's where the air is sitting. The air that's doing the heat transfer is not at TS, it's not at T infinity. It's actually between them. It's squeezed in that boundary layer. So TF is a better representation of this guy. And why do I need the key? Right, because the nozzle has the K in it. So you know that our job is to get the H, but the H is always given in a formula saying nozzle equal Reynolds time parental. So once you put your hand on the nozzle, you would say, now how can I get the H out of it? Ah, uh, the nozzle is H L over K. So basically, solving heat transfer problem, you know, you just go ahead and get the K parental and the new. Right? So the key is 0 0.0219 watt per meter Kelvin. Now we are ready to get the renewals, and it is 3.5, 10 to power 6. What do you think? Laminar, turbulent, mixed? So, so I, I, let's, in this course, I, I told you that transition is a little bit a hazy region, right? But we, let's take in this course, at 5, 10 to power 5. Anything bigger than 5, 10 to power 5, we are not laminar anymore. 
Say that again. You had mentioned earlier that it ranged from. Correct. It it has a range, right? But but forget about this range again. I was just telling you this for your life later after this course. But in this course, this range does not exist. In this course, the flow jump from lamina to tibland at five ten to bar five. So it is turbulent, and we will not use the fully turbulent formula. That the formula for all turbulent, we are not there yet. It's not 10 to power 8 or 9 where the whole plate is turbulent. We will have to use. Did it mention a, a region where you can say, okay, at this point it's all turbulent or all turbulent? Yeah, it said uh, the Reynolds number between 10 and 30. All right, he gave you a range. Okay. And so this formula here that I'm writing, 87 multiplied by parental to power 1 third. This is valid for renals smaller than 10 to power 7. So if you are higher than 10 to power 7, don't use it. And bigger than 5, 10 to power 5. So that's for the... That's when you are in between. So basically what I'm saying is that you have part of the flow is laminar and the other part is turbulent. So really, the bound layer would probably be something like this. And then like this. Right? So when I use a mixed formula, like this one. Right? So we got the renals, we got the parental. So the Nusselt number, and this, by the way, this was over the entire plate. So this is not a uh, local edge. This is the whole thing. So that Nusselt number is 4968. And again, the Nusselt number is H, L over K. You know the K, you know the L. That's the end of the plate. You can get the H out of it as 21.8 Watt per meter square Kelvin. Now, later on in the exam, you could actually say, well, how much heat they are losing from the, from the hot so that they can basically buy a heater and keep them warm. So the Q would be from that wind, from that roof, how much heat is losing? They are losing from the roof. H, A, H A, delta, T. delta T, and the delta T would be T infinity minus T roof. So, but we will no, they didn't. But in, if they ask for the Q, they will have to give you this T S. Okay. All right. No, we are not solving for it. I'm saying just in case. Right? Actually, what would be interesting to this problem would be he may not give you TS, but he will give you T room. Right? And he will give you the, he will say this is out of whatever material with that thickness and with that K. Give us the Q. So the Q would be. Convection, conduction, convection. And the Q would be delta T from T room all the way to T infinity divided by the three resistance. Convection on the inner, the conduction through the roof material, and then convection on the top. And the convection through the top, that what we just calculated. That H, or this H that we just calculated, that's H out, the H of the air. Okay? 